ghost of Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> yeah. I actually graduated from the same high school that Jimi Hendrix got kicked out of. I, who did better? I, <clears throat> he's dead. You're not. Yeah, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Who had more fun? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear <laughs> Jimmy had more fun. So, come on. Well, I've had fun. Storage is fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. Storage is fun. I think being a rock star is more fun. Anybody want to argue with that? Storage analyst, rock star. Lifespan's not good. Yeah, lifespan, right? Um, also, the money's better if you're a rock star in addition to all the other fringe benefits. So, actually, if he had gotten decent emergency medical care, he might still be with us. It's, uh, that's the really sad part about Jimmy's death. So, I'm a fan, I admit it. Okay, are we uh, ready to rock, so to speak? Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, panel discussion on big data, object storage for big data. I'm Robin Harris. I'm a chief analyst of storagemojo.com, and I also write for ZDNet. And one of these days, uh, IBM storage community, uh, they keep waiting for me to, de to deliver something, and one of these days I will. So, uh, and then uh, with us today on the, uh, on the panel, uh, Tom Layden, who works for Ampladata, a uh, European-based uh, uh, optic storage company. Uh, Mike Flathers, who's uh, chief technologist for Aspera, which is a networking uh, company. Uh, David Chapa, who's the chief technology evangelist uh, for Quantum, uh, makers of Storenext, which is a very widely used uh, uh, optic storage system, file system. Uh, Chinmay Patel, Cloud Marketing Manager, Intel Corporation, and uh, Ranajit Navasha, VP of Marketing, Panzura. And we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, all of these guys. This is the slowest laptop. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, people are just going to, I'm going to let people introduce themselves and their companies very briefly, and then we're going to go right into the panel discussion. And then, we're going to open it up to you. So I hope you're thinking about some questions you would like to get answered, because there's a lot of expertise on this panel. And there's some expertise in the audience, hopefully, that I may call on. So, okay. Uh, let's start. Tom? Thank you, Robin. So, uh, yes, I'm Tom Layden. I work for a company called Ampladata. I promised the organizers that I wasn't going to pitch, but... Uh, yeah, and since my competitors are filming me, I have to be careful with what I'm saying. It's all right. Um, you probably expected girls or something. Uh, but no, we provide a very scalable uh, object storage platform uh, that allows you to store uh, very large uh, amounts of data at a low cost. That is our pitch. We provide the highest throughput on the market. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm Mike Flathers, Chief Technologist for Spare Developer. Uh, platform. So I'm responsible for all of the uh, uh, the APIs, SDKs, the integrations with partners uh, and customers. Um, very big believer in you know, in the ability to uh, have really good APIs that allow uh, people to integrate. Um, Aspera itself provides. We have a, a high speed transport and applications that ride on top of that transport that enable uh, movement of uh, of data uh, over WANs, uh, irrespective of uh, uh, latency or packet loss. I'm David Chap with Quantum. Uh, Quantum is uh, focused on big data management and data protection. We also have cloud solutions. Uh, we are specialists in these areas. Uh, have a long, long history. We've been around for about 32 years. And uh, my my role in the company is to uh, think of me as the, the external voice of the office of CTO. So uh, get a lot of input in from customers uh, and I work uh, with our engineering and our technical working groups uh, back at corporate to continue to develop our products uh, to meet our customers' needs. Good afternoon. Chinmay Patel from Intel Corporation. 
uh, I do cloud marketing for the storage group at Intel. At Intel, we provide key building blocks for all the you know uh, three pillars of the data center that is compute, networking, and storage. We also work very closely with our rich ecosystem to provide solutions and build uh, you know blueprints for uh, the cloud infrastructure and uh, data center infrastructure. If you guys are interested in finding uh, more details about the Intel's cloud initiatives as well as some of the reference architectures that we have put together, please visit www.intelcloudbuilders.com. Thank you. My name is uh, Ranjit Nevatia. I'm with a company called Panzura. Panzura is a global file system, uh, sort of a NAS device, which uh, ties multiple different locations into a single uh, global file system again. Uh, but it sits on top of some of these object storage which you're going to hear um, today. And we make that object storage consumable by enterprise applications by giving it your traditional access using SIPs or NFS. The uh, uh, best way to think of us is we are a NAS device with no storage in it. That storage comes from an object storage backend which could uh, live either locally as a private cloud or live uh, externally as a public cloud. And that NAS is then tied together across multiple sites to give you a, a unified view into a single namespace so that you have full access to that cloud storage uh, across all of your enterprise. Okay, great. Um, so to get the uh, panel dis discussion started, uh, really, I mean, object storage is, is an idea that's been kicking around for quite a few years. So I, I'd just like to get comments. Why now? Why is object storage important now? Sir. It's just the, uh, the volumes of data that are being generated today. Uh, so we've seen an increase in, 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 in data generation uh, over the past decades, but uh, it's exponential. Uh, it's, it's, the growth has, has never been as big as today. Think of all the video cameras, like our friend there, the photo cameras that we're all using, but also of all the applications, uh, big data applications, uh, security cameras uh, everywhere, uh, images in hospitals. So we need to find, or we had to find a way to, to store all of that data in a more efficient way. And um, most of that data, and the data that I have been mentioning is unstructured data, particularly for uh, unstructured data, uh, object storage is a uh, better solution than uh, the storage we were using until today, which is uh, file-based storage, where we have scalability issues that we will probably talk about in this session. Uh, it's one of the, uh, the dilemma in the industry, though, is, is you know, that, that uh, we have a lot of this data coming our way. We have, uh, you know, invested so heavily into so many enterprise applications. And uh, on one hand, you know, we want to actually simplify the way of storing and accessing this data. But then we have these enterprise applications that we are stuck with, right? And they don't speak objects somehow. You know, a lot of these, you know, uh, applications. So that's where I think innovations from companies like Panzura sort of come into play and kind of try to bridge that gap. So. We got to look at the file system. You talk about the non-data that's been being created. I mean, every day we're generating or, or capturing about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. 90% of all the data that's been created has been created. The world's data has been created in the last two years. And so, uh, I was, you know, I was a backup guy for a long time. That's that's where I that's where I, I got my chops. And when you you go to back up the data, the, the the backup application would go and walk the file system. That was the biggest hairiest thing that this process did. Now, if you think about the amount of data that we're creating today, going to walk a file system like that is nuts. I mean, we need to get a flatter, um, a flatter solution, and object is going gonna, is gonna to help us to do that. I think along those lines, I mean, the economics are changing as well, so um, more and more data is being produced. Um, in a lot, you know, different fields than, than uh, the traditional like media and entertainment, for example. Um, but and, and the reason, the reason that the economics are, you know, are, are, are changing, more data is, is uh, able to be uh, produced, is is that now, you know, cloud infrastructures and um, 
you know, virtual machine assistants and those kind of things. We can actually bring up more and more compute to actually opt to produce the data and then operate on that data once it is produced. Yeah, to your point, Mike, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just going to brag a little bit about myself. I go to the film school trying to learn, you know, uh, filmmaking. And, uh, you know, the digital camera, right, they will come, come around and directors are getting lazy about rehearsing. So they are capturing at 4K and now 6K, 8K, uh, you know, uh, levels, right? Uh, a lot of the data that they never were capturing and, you know, nobody deletes the data, right? The argument that they make on the set is, well, you know, whatever we don't need, we're going to throw it away. Because they're not paying for film anymore. Exactly, but on the other hand, they still have to store all that data. Right. Nobody throws any data away. By show of hand, let's let's kind of take a you know uh, uh, survey here. That how, how many of you actually throw your data away? How many delete the data? How many people delete the data here? All right, so one out of how many, right? Two. Uh, it's <laughs> two. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so guys, how many, how many, is, exactly how many right? is Gmail, right? <laughs> So, so the problem is, is that the data, right, with all these, you know, other innovations, the data is being generated at the level that is just, you know, uh, unsustainable, and there needs to be, you know, something needs to be done about it. I think uh, uh, I'll answer this a little bit differently to provide a why, why, why can't all this data be stored on SANS or NAS, right? I mean, that's really the fundamental issue here, which is why, why does it need objects? So SAN and NAS technology have stayed with us for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And they have come to a point where the size of data is challenging that traditional RAID architecture. So RAID was fine when you had a 200 megabyte or 200 gigabyte or maybe a terabyte drive. Now, when you're trying to build, build a petabyte file system or a petabyte storage system, um, first of all, you've got to use very large drives. And when you're using these large drives, uh, you've got to use a lot of these drives, right? So in a typical modern data center, if you go into like inside Google's data center or inside Amazon's data center, you're not going to see traditional NAS or SAN because if they did, there will be a guy who would be there just replacing hard drives all day long and still not keep up with the drive failures and the rebuild of those drive failures given that these larger drives take a much longer time to rebuild. So that traditional NAS or SAN architecture, which was based on RAID, which was based on some sort of a mirroring technology in the back end, which did volume mirroring, or some sort of a replication technology, which replicated that entire stack of array to another location, was just, just not feasible anymore with the kind of, uh, or with the amount of storage which, here, which we are talking about here. So that required a complete rethink of how you want to lay down your, uh, your data on, on a storage infrastructure. And essentially that's where objects come into play. The way objects use storage today is not at that uh, traditional volume or LUN level. Uh, they, they are literally stored in the form of objects. And it's that object uh, which then gets replicated internally or, uh, across multiple drives. So when a drive failure happens, um, that, that objects then get replicates to a different drive. If a site failure happens, then there is another uh, site where that object might be available. That's what allows that object storage to really um, help you build that mega scale uh, storage system, which just it's, it's not possible with traditional architecture. If it is, it's extremely expensive and very difficult to manage. And, and you, you know, rebuild times, yes, but then performance degradation during that rebuild. Absolutely. You know, there's, I read an article, and I forget which manufacturer, but the 60 terabyte drive should be here by 2015. I would not want to have that in my data center rebuilding if that should go in the tank. Exactly. So yeah, maybe I should, in, uh, should throw in the, uh, the, the dirty word here, uh, erasure coding. I think uh, it's a very important uh, piece of technology that you need in your uh, object storage platform. Well, but before we get into erasure coding, I just want to make sure everybody has an idea of what object storage actually is. Yeah. So does somebody want to take a crack at uh, defining object well, storage? I would actually like to see what the attendees understand about object storage. If well, of course, this is a very sad group. Everybody understands object does storage. Have anything to do, does this object storage have anything to do with the object-oriented programming language? No. 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 Then why do we call it object? Uh, that is a very good question. <laughs> 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 
question. Really well. That's, That's an excellent, excellent question. <laughs> would, would somebody please define object storage? To or, put, or I will. To put it very simply, an object is still your file, but with metadata, with information about your file that is richer than the information that was added to your file when it was in a file system. The interesting thing is an object storage platform is created as one single storage pool, okay, where you throw all your files without having to remember where you put it, like in a file system. An analogy that I always like to use here is like it's like parking your car. When you park your car in a parking garage somewhere, you have to remember in which street the garage was, on which level you are, in which row you have to find it back. Object storage is like using a valet service. You arrive at your car, you give them your keys, you get a ticket. A ticket is also what you get with, with, um, with object storage. We call it a, a pointer or other companies you use different names. And then when you need your car, you present your ticket to the valet. Now the valet is in the object storage architecture, the application. Okay. So when you need to find your, your file, you don't have to, to look for it in your file system. The application is going to look for it based on the metadata that is stored together with your file in the object pool. Does that make sense? So does it mean that you say, for example, we store some data in some place, and then once we store it, we get a key. Yes. And then to get the data back, we simply use the key. That's all. Yeah, the application does that for you. So a, a, a very practical example, um, and I don't have any benefit by talking about Google, but it's just a, a good example because people use that application, Google Picasa. So in the old days, you would store your pictures uh, on your computer in a file system based per year, per month, per party, whatever, depending on how organized you are, right? With Google Picasa, you don't have to do that. You just throw them all in. Probably still in a file system, but that doesn't matter because object storage can still have a file system on top of it. But anyway, it's the concept that I'm trying to explain here. If you want to find a picture of your kid, Google Picasa can present you all the pictures of your kid based on, for example, one picture, and it's going to do face recognition. Or if you want to find all the pictures that you shot of the Golden Gate Bridge, based on smart calculations that the application uh, can do for you, it will present you all of that. See, the application has a lot more smartness than a file system can have. That's a big difference. So, in, in, in the future, in the months and years to come, more and more companies will build applications that talk directly to the storage, which is a lot fast, faster, a lot, a lot more efficient, and a lot more user-friendly. Does this have anything to do with the Hadoop? Uh, no, you're probably confused by the big data aspect, which we haven't dug into. Um, should I, or should someone else? Well, before we go there, we'll come back to that one. I, I, I want to, um, you know, object storage. I'm, I'm almost 50 years old, so when I hear object storage, that, that sounds really oh, weird, doesn't it? Oh, holy crap! <laughs> okay, let's hope he makes it to the end of the panel, folks. <laughs> When I hear object storage, that's the first time I've ever said that. That sounds really weird. Uh, I think of these content addressable storage solutions that were used for archive and the immutability of data. And you put a file in, and the file gets uh, a, a, basically a cryptographic signature that's delivered back. And then that file is not modified. When, when I was an IT admin guy and I heard object storage, that's that's what it meant to me. But what we're talking about here is, is object storage, but it's object storage a little bit on steroids, I think. To the level or yeah, right. I like steroids. Yeah, you like that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't like steroids. <laughs> I don't like steroids. <laughs> I don't like steroids. <laughs> <laughs> you and Lance Armstrong. So. Um. Yeah, it was a Belgian guy who provided the York <laughs> So um, but the uh, yeah, I mean your question about Hadoop, I mean Hadoop. Uh, is very similar in uh, uh, technology to Google's MapReduce, which r ran, runs on the Google file system, or the second version of the Google file system. And the Google file system is an object-based storage system. So fundamentally, there's no particular reason that Hadoop can't run, uh, that I'm aware of. I mean, you know, architecturally, it couldn't run on an object storage system. I think it's just up to however they implement it. So, but Google and MapReduce, they certainly use object storage for MapReduce. 
one of the you know uh, one of the ways that I've seen people talk about sort of having this large amount of data that you know Hadoop infrastructure would sort of uh, work on. Right, where, where are you going to store all that data? That storage for the data would probably be in object storage moving forward. And, and, and also related to big data, uh, so we are now talking about big unstructured data. So we're Hadoop and MapReduce for solutions to, to store big data, the small log files generated by all sorts of applications. Uh, where these, yeah, Hadoop and MapReduce would solve the, the scalability issues of a relational database which suddenly couldn't handle all that uh, input anymore. Uh, object storage is now solving the problems that a file system has. So that's why, why we're calling it big unstructured data. Now it's the file system that doesn't scale and has other problems beyond that. Right. So uh, hence, big unstructured data, object storage for big unstructured data. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I saw another question here. The question was regarding the rebuilding the RAID and everything we have all right now. But behind the scene, in the back end, Anyway, we need to build that storage infrastructure. How this is different than in object storage than the normal storage? So, I, I mean, I think you should take this because this actually gets to the the, the core of the erasure coding. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's a great question. Let's make sure we address it before we go. Uh, but uh, now, with with object storage, you you know, you've got this flat namespace. And now you're just storing individual objects, right? And typically there's a key to reach them. It's like typically 128 bits. Um, and so one of the things that makes this different than RAID, because after all, you know, you've got RAID 5, you've got RAID 6, everybody at least thinks they understand them. Uh, and, and object storage systems typically use a very different way of storing the data which makes use of erasure coding technology. So, somebody want to talk about erasure coding? So, let me just kind of you know set the stage for you, right? <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, 10, 10 plus years ago, right, when Google started, and Google was getting all this data, and you know they were they were trying to understand as to how do we store this data reliably, uh, somewhat reliably, right? Uh, so that we don't have to crawl the web again and kind of reconstruct the entire data set that we have. And still not incur the uh, cost that you know uh, otherwise you know would be required, right? If if you were to use some of the uh, purpose-built appliances for storage, so they you know uh, made a concerted effort to actually use the standard high-volume servers, and then they said, well, we need the data reliability, so we're just going to make three copies, three exact copies of the same data. So if we lose one of the copies, we have another copy available. Now, you know, Google itself is seeing, you know, uh, tremendous, uh, ro you know, uh, growth in the data, and so is everybody else. And that's where I think there was a need to actually optimize on what the original model was to just make one or two or three extra copies of the same data. And that's where I think things such as erasure code, uh, you know, the concepts themselves are not new, but they were applied to some of the other fields. But they became, you know, applicable in the storage industry as well. Oh, that's a good intro. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what what I wanted to say here before explaining how erasure coding works is not all object storage solutions um, are the same. I mean, there is uh, there are a lot of offerings there, and I think it's safe to say that probably 95% of you guys are using object storage, and probably half of you guys don't even know which storage uh, that exactly is. So a lot of Online storage is object storage, but there are different ways to, to, uh, to provide it. Um, some technologies um, are, are, basically, uh, are basically just uh, co making copies of, of your object. So, for example, uh, uh, the OpenStack Swift solution is, is uh, what we call a, a three copies in the cloud. Uh, then there are object storage platforms that are using traditional RAID uh, underneath and just putting an object layer on top of it could be good for the application. You still have a lot of benefits of all the object storage, but uh, then you run into the, uh, the issues of RAID, you run into scalability issues, uh, durability issues, etc. And then there are a couple of solutions, and incidentally ours is one of those, um, that are using a, a 
new technology, but it's not new, and let me dig into that later, uh, called erasure coding. So erasure coding has been around for, for several decades. It was first used, and, and I think the founders of Aspera uh, have some, uh, uh, some experience with that uh, as well. It was first used for communication with space, where we're, uh, they were uh, experiencing uh, loss of, of, of pieces of the message, and, and they still had to be able to understand the message. So they came up with a technology, erasure coding, uh, to, to make sure that they would understand every message that was transferred with, with space. Later on, erasure coding was also used for the compact disc player, uh, so, or the discs actually, where um, the data is stored uh, using erasure coding, and if you have a scratch on your CD, if it's not too deep, if not too much data is lost, you can still listen to your music without any hiccups. So uh, we used a, uh, a more advanced form of erasure coding, or even the most advanced form. And the, the way how it works, so erasure coding is really meant uh, versus the three copies in the cloud. We, we are solving the, the overhead problem versus uh, RAID. We are solving several problems. So one of them is, is, is the uh, rebuild uh, problem that uh, RAID systems have. Uh, another one is also the overhead, because with RAID, you will typically also still use replication. So you, RAID 6 and replication typically still gives you a 200% overhead. So uh, erasure coding really reduces the overhead and allows you to, to build a storage system that scales uniformly. So you can just start with a 200 terabyte system, let's say, and you add nodes as you need, and, and the system grows as one system with just one management uh, interface. Now, how does it work? And now you have to bear with me. Usually I have a slide, but uh, something went wrong. Uh, so. Imagine an object, and to make it easy for you guys, uh, imagine the number 75, that is your object. In real life that would be a movie, a picture, a Word document, an Excel document, whatever. But take the number 75. We're not going to store 3 times 75 like, for example, Swift would do, but what we are going to do is we're going to split it up in smaller blocks, 7 and 5. Your movie would be split up in, for, for example, 4,000 blocks, okay? But just to keep it easy, we split it up in 7 and 5. And what we actually store is a series of formulas that allow us to recalculate our original object. So for example, we would be storing 2x uh, plus y equals 19, x plus y equals 12, etc. We're going to generate some overhead. So we're going to uh, generate more equations than we actually need to restore our data object. And the equations are going to be spread all over your system, so over all the disks and the nodes, as widely as possible, over different racks and even data centers, if you want. Um, and then when you need to reconstruct your original data object, you take the best available equations. So even if equations disappear forever, you can always, and there we work with policies, and I don't want to dig too deep into that, um, you always have sufficient equation, equations available to reconstruct your original data object. Now the result is that in, in, in a system with erasure coding, you never have to rebuild the disk. If the disk is broken, the system is going to generate new equations spread over all the system. So that allows, and there's a lot of benefits, and I have to stop here at some point, but that allows you to work with uh, low power processors. We're currently uh, using the uh, Intel E3 uh, <coughs> processor, power saving, overhead saving, etc. So bottom line is, if you want to implement an object storage platform, make sure that it runs technology that has a very low overhead, that uses low power because those technologies exist, and only that will uh, be sustainable as we are growing beyond petabytes. So it is essentially, instead of storing three copies, you're storing one copy, and you are distributing the data across multiple stripes, multiple storage nodes, multiple disks, so that when one of the disks you know, fails, you have multiple other agents. Instead of one agent reconstructing the original data, you have now 10, 20, 30 agents trying to reconstruct the data. That means the rebuild times reduce from two or three days down to two or three hours. Correct. Thanks. It yeah. doesn't have to be the disk. It can just be uh, a block. It could be small bits on the drive that uh, have become corrupt. And, and the data can then be redistributed because of the policies that says, I need to have this many equations. Correct. Those are not accessible and then it redistributes. It can be on a block level, disk level, right. node level, and we even support geospreading, but I don't want to get into So the other thing I wanted to point out is that data is not stored in plain text, right? It is stored obfuscated in, in 
form of the equations. Yep, it's, it's mathematics. It's ones and zeros. For extra security level, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody can pull the driver and park it and walk away. You're just going to get some gibberish in their pocket. Yep. So I'm going to make two comments to simplify this. First of all, you got to get rid of that erasure word in your recording. <laughs> With storage guys, you don't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. It was not the market, uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> To, to answer your original question, which is uh, RAID versus why this, I mean, RAID creates this parity bit at the volume level, basically. And everything which was described here was just another way of creating that parity bit across a smaller object, which can be uh, recreated a lot easier than typical volume-based recreation of a RAID group. So that's essentially what was taught here. So, Yeah, the, the, the higher level... Um, uh, discussion around this technology in, in other circles, you'll hear people say forward error correcting, forward error correction. And it's, it's, the, it's the idea that I'm going to assume failure, so I'm going to have uh, additional metadata, or in communication language, I'm going to make sure that I can recreate that message once I send it on the other end, if I lose some of the bits in between. So, Erasure coding, for error correction, it, it's it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's not. When you make two copies, it's mirroring. When you do RAID five, it's erasure coding. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, right. if if you go back and you look at the original uh, Patterson, Gibson, and Katz paper on RAID that was published, what Berkeley eighty eight, eighty nine, something like that. Uh, I mean, they used erasure coding to to come up with RAID five um, and. But the fact is, is that the math has really advanced in the last 20 years. And it's, it's really in the last probably uh, 10 years that we've gotten these really advanced erasure codes that I don't think I actually heard a number from anybody, but you can, you can protect against four different failures, and whether a failure is a, a drive or an unrecoverable read error or a, 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 you know, a rack or a, piece of box of storage in a rack or an entire site, you can you can recover from up to four failures with on the order of 50 to 60 percent overhead. So if you're storing a petabyte, instead of having three copies and having three petabytes, you can have one and a half petabytes and you can protect against more failures than you can with three copies. I mean, it's, it's pretty magical. Um, I mean, it sounds like voodoo, uh, but they're, uh, they're really doing it. Pardon? It is for them. It is for them. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so that's why the guys, you know, they have the dolls with the pins. Uh, but anyway, I, I, uh, uh, if I can put in a uh, plug for storagemojo.com, uh, a couple of weeks ago I wrote about uh, Windows Azure storage and how they're, they've done some very creative things with uh, erasure coding. Uh, and then I've uh, done some work with Ampla Data as well and have a video on it. So if you've got somebody kind of non-technical to explain it to, like a CFO, uh, you might try uh, looking at one of those videos. Just to say, you know, the, the same concepts apply in moving the data, right? As well, it's not just store once it finally gets stored on the device. You have to move the data to the to your you know to the storage at some point anyway. So um, you know, it's the same types of things apply when you use an unreliable transport underneath to actually deliver. So the, the, the same type of the, you know, encoding and, and uh, mathematics that apply to actually make that really fast as well as, as far as the data movement goes. Right, right. So uh, I guess the, the one question is, uh, you know, storage people tend to be very allergic to new technology. So really, how mature is this advanced duration coding technology? Who wants to take it? So, I mean, you know, I'll take a crack at that, right? I mean, if, as, as Dave was saying, right, this was, this forward correction, error correction algorithm has been around in the, you know, uh, digital signal transmissions for a, for a while that, you know, we have seen it on compact disks and such. But uh, one of the early uh, adoption in the storage industry came from, you know, a company, a small company called EMC, right? Uh, EMC has a product with Isilon and Atmos, right? So it's been around Windows, you know, as you mentioned, Windows Azure also has the Azure code to protect the uh, data, as well as few other companies like, uh, you know, Ampli Data and CleverSafe and Scality, 
you know, which are some of the newer companies, but they have some of the technologies that also provide very compelling uh, technologies to, to protect against data failure. The U.S. government's been using this technology for a long time in the digital signal processing and communication. So this, this is not anything that's brand new that is, uh, would be a worry to me if I was a storage editor. Okay. So ju just a comment again on that erasure code or not to erasure code. The real question is, has the object storage been around for a long time and is that really a mature technology? And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, all modern data centers who are dealing with multiple petabytes of data, I mean, if you go inside Google's data center, if you go inside Facebook's data center, if you going to go inside Amazon's data center, you're not going to see, what you're going to see is bulk of that storage, petabytes of it, hundreds of petabytes of it, is actually sitting on object storage. And so that object storage technology is very, very, very mature. I mean, all of you guys are using it, as Tom mentioned. You know, your YouTube videos, they're not Facebook. stored on a NAS or SAN. Your Facebook pictures, they are all stored on object storage, and they are being copied multiple times uh, to get that protection in place. So that begs the question, so how come all these modern data centers are using object storage? It's so cheap, so cost-effective, so scalable. How come it hasn't come into the enterprise? That's, that's really... And I want to add something, because you bring, uh, bring up something interesting here. Uh, I was talking to a guy from uh, Amazon a couple of uh, weeks ago at IBC in Amsterdam, and I didn't know that, but he told me that Amazon is also using erasure coding. So for all of those who had questions about how they can go so low in their prices, uh, apparently that is because they were using a lot less uh, raw storage than we were all assuming to provide the levels of uh, availability that, that they offer. So, um, but fortunately, people who want to, to have their own object storage uh, infrastructure uh, can now achieve uh, the same durability or even better durability with uh, similar or more overhead because it's getting more available. But I think uh, Ranji asked a very good question. If this stuff is so freaking great, why isn't everybody using it? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I remember I was, I was a product manager in one of the very first RAID arrays uh, over 20 years ago. And uh, I, I'm actually, uh, David, I'm actually over 50. Are you? 51? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and people probably don't remember how long it took for RAID arrays to become uh, basically half the market. It was almost uh, 10 years before pretty much half of enterprise data storage was actually put on RAID arrays as opposed to individual disks and mirrored and you know, things like that. Um, so I think we're going to see a long, uh, long uptake. Even SCSI took a while too. <coughs> Even SCSI took a while. Even SCSI took a while. But you're younger than me. You shouldn't know that. Well, anyway. I, I, I read books. You read it. Okay. <laughs> um, read your blogs. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but I, I mean, I see a number of different issues, and I'd like to get you know people's opinions about why we're not seeing the uptake. Uh, one of the big issues I see is that the way most uh, capital authorizations for storage are done. Uh, and this is not a technical issue, this is a business issue. Uh, most storage acquisitions are attached to a particular project. And one of the things about, uh, about object storage is because it's a high scale system, it really only starts making sense once you're starting at a few hundred terabytes. Uh, so a, a reasonable sized infrastructure just to start with, and one that you're planning is gonna grow into the multi petabyte range. Um, and, uh, and, and when you demand, as a lot of CFOs, I think mostly through force of habit, demand that that, um, that that infrastructure be attached to a single project, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're limiting yourself to media and entertainment companies, geophysical, you know, 3D uh, 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 seismic data, uh, medical imaging, you know, things like that that are really huge users but essentially single applications. Um, but I think a real uh, potential for object storage in the enterprise 
is as a horizontal storage technology as, a, as an archive, you know, an active archive, for example, or for storing backups, uh, snapshots, things like that. Um, and yet, we haven't really figured out how to, uh, how to present that to CFOs in a way that they see the business benefit of it. And I don't know about your organizations, but most of the ones I talk to, CFOs really have the ultimate power now, much more so than CIOs, typically. CIOs recommend, CFOs decide. But I'd like to get other impressions. I think it should be an easy story, right? It's, uh, would you like to save 50% of the cost today? Right? And the answer that CFO probably would have is, how do I do that and where do I sign it? What do I need to do? Right? And CIO at that point is trying to stay in the company and not get fired. Right? So he's going to say, let's, let's get this object storage uh, infrastructure in place. The question would be, would my application stop to them? If they don't, if they need the file you know, infrastructure uh, interface in front of them, I think companies like Panjura can actually fill in that gap. And companies can take advantage of uh, you know such infrastructure today. A lot of the people I've talked to, right, they will say, "Well, this is a strategic investment for us." No, 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 not just strategic. It needs to be happened today. Right? We're, we're getting that kind of traction today with customers in object mm -hmm. storage and, and in Gartman. I mean, big, big, huge archives. And media entertainment. You mentioned that. I and mean, you mentioned the three areas that that store next is uh, uh, really, really making some huge waves with object storage. And I, I think one of, the, one of the things is you get away from those three, uh, those three areas that actually recognize the need, actually have the, the multi-terabytes, 100 terabytes of, of data. You get away from those, those, those markets and those spaces. I think one of the reasons why it's not being adopted as quickly is because we talk about, when we say object storage, I, uh, I've seen this, I, I've been on a three week tour around the world, I was in Asia, I was in uh, Korea, I was in Japan, I was in the UK, and I started talking about object storage, and the lights went off, because the assumption <coughs> at the other end was, I, I already know what object storage is, but I had to re-educate them on what we're really talking about, what, what really is this new object storage, and it really is a new way of looking at object storage. I think that's one of the reasons, is I think that there's an awareness component, you have a CIO that says, I, I know object storage, that's not what we need. And the CFO that says, I want to save money, but you have this conflict. So, I mean, I think what, what you're referring to, David, is uh, uh, the very unfortunate experience a lot of people have had with uh, EMC's and Terra product. Uh, the content addressable storage, which is essentially, it's an object store, uh, but the performance was pretty horrible. Uh, getting your data out of it, it was the Roach Motel of data, uh, you know, you put your data in and it never comes out uh, unless you spend a lot of money with EMC services. Gosh, who, who, would, who would guess? And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, Centera kind of uh, muddied the waters for, for object storage. And this is a new game. But it's a totally new game. But we're really educating on, on, on two fields here. So what David is referring to is more the technical guys, the guys who look under the hood, what the engine is doing. But uh, the examples that you were giving, this is more on the CFO level who, who doesn't care about blocks and erasure coding and whatever, but he, he really wants to see um, what it's gonna bring to his company. And, and it's been mentioned uh, before, so, so those archives, I think, is, is uh, really what's important for object storage to break through. And, and the, the very short message here is uh, monetize your archives. The way how data is archived today um, and I don't want to be too negative about tape, but I mean, we, all, go we, we all know the, the latency yeah, and, 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 and the, <laughs> uh, it, it's very it's very difficult to, to, to make data on tape easy accessible to a lot of employees in the, in, in the company, let alone to, to customers outside of the company. For example, media and entertainment, and I'm thinking about the sports industry, for example, uh, UEFA, the, the soccer association in Europe, yeah, not from here, um, they moved all their old games off tape on disc to be able to have people uh, view the old games on, on demand over the internet. So instead of the, the UEFA having to pay money for their, for their archive and it being a cost center, now suddenly it, it's a profit center, it's bringing revenue, it's just exactly the same data 
but stored differently with advantages of, of technologies. And, and it's not not just uh, uh, UEFA with like with the Euro. It's it's um, you know uh, probably the Olympics. It's the Olympics. It's you know a ton of sporting events. We'll probably see the same things coming up with other major sporting events as well. And um, you know I, I think it's been mentioned before, but what what's going to make it you know take off in the enterprise? It'll probably be somewhat similar to RAID or SCSI or whatever, where there's going to be it's going to be brought in for a particular project. It's going to be there. Then, hey, I don't have to buy this anymore. I don't have to buy a whole new storage system. I can just add on to this, right? And 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 then the cost effectiveness is going to shine through. So it, it, we, I think we're we're starting to see a lot of that kind of uptake uh, with our sales right now as well. There's also Once again, I, I'll offer a much more controversial view into this. So we've been focusing too much on the benefits of object storage. It comes at a cost, right? So there are some negatives to object no. storage. So let's talk about those, right? Let's talk. So first of all, object storage, it's not blocks, it's not files, it's objects, which means it's talking a completely new language, which none of you or none of the applications understand, so I don't know how to use it. So I can't use it in the enterprise. So that's the biggest problem today with object storage. The second biggest problem, I'm going to go with the analogy of what Tom mentioned, right? You got that ticket from the valet, now it's time for you to go get your car. Well, guess what? You get the ticket and you're standing there. You're waiting, waiting for your car to show up. You know, you're not at liberty to just walk over to your car and drive it away. You have to wait till that uh, door person actually brings that car over to you, which means there's quite a bit of potentially quite a bit of latency that's involved, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, Amazon just announced something called Glacier Storage. Uh, glacier Storage is extremely cold storage. And they have the same valet system where they, if you give a ticket, that car is going to come back to you after four hours. Yeah, right? but you're comparing yeah. to a latency of tape. I, I yes, think agreed. Sure All I'm saying right. is uh, there is a performance aspect of object storage because of which today it's not as consumable with traditional... Now, archive is a good use case, I agree. Uh, but traditional NAS or traditional file interfaces, which is what all of us are uh, familiar with, that kind of interaction, that kind of real-time uh, IOPS and latency is just not available today in object storage. Right? So as a result, the use cases of object storage is somewhat currently being promoted around archive. Now, I'm going to differ. I'm going to say the use cases can be a lot more. What object storage is solving, I mean, there are really two things which is going on in the industry today, right? There are vendors who are addressing performance. And by the way, object storage are not the ones addressing that. It's basically all of the SSD guys, and they're addressing it with either uh, server-based uh, PCIe cards which are full of memory or uh, host-based ar arrays which are built fully of SSD. So if you want performance, that's where you go. But they can't give you capacity. If you want a petabyte capacity, you will not do it with them. That's where the object storage comes in. So the object storage is really solving this problem of how am I going to manage all of that capacity. Uh, and anytime you have any kind of capacity, it should really be stored inside the object storage. So that's, and what I am going to provide here, and this is a plug-in for Panzura here, uh, with Panzura what we have done is we are a NAS product, so traditional NFS, SIFS, which serves your backup application, your archive application, as well as your office docs and archive application and tax images and video editing software, whatever you are using today to collaborate across uh, all that, your ex large Excel spreadsheets, now all of that gets served in the form of either files or archives or backups, but then stores everything into this object storage so that you can get that advantage of capacity from this storage, which is extremely efficient in terms of manageability and scale. Yes, so, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think what, what's been said here is at odds with what you suggested and you kind of, kind of lined us up, you know, like butting heads. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's true at all. I, I, no, no, no I, I, I understand. I, and, and, that's, and, that, and that's great, but there, there's absolutely the legacy applications and you know, Panzura is you know, awesome to help with that kind of stuff. But there's also a whole new class of applications that are, that are coming about in the enterprises, will continue and hopefully will be even more prevalent that know how to talk object storage and we'll see the benefits there as well. So it's not just legacy, it's new applications as well. Which are coming right. Different lenses being applied to the storage. And, and, and in, in a lot of um, enterprise environments, the applications may not be ready. And at that point, I totally agree. 
uh, it, it's very useful to put a, a file system layer on top of the object storage, so then you have all the benefits of the object storage and the benefits of your file systems. But I strongly disagree with, with uh, your, your uh, latency statement. I, I think the throughput uh, th that, that some and our uh, object storage uh, systems provide, I mean, you're able to, to, to stream movies or, or, or music. Uh, we provide through, we scale throughput separately. If, if you need six gigabyte per second throughput, we can do that. If you need 10, we can do that as well. Uh, so while I strongly agree with the need for more applications to talk directly to the object storage, I do disagree with the latency and the uh, performance. Because is, is it is there. Are you specifically talking throughput or IOPS? Right. Not IOPS. That's so a, object I was store. mentioning IOPS. Yeah, that's uh, what okay, good. So uh, on the on the on the scale of performance and capacity, I think you know object storage is you know more applicable towards the capacity scale of the you know of the of the. When talking object storage, we're never going to promote uh, anything that is really uh, IOPS sensitive. We, we are not positioning for databases. We are not positioning for, for email, uh, for, for, for VMs or any of that. Object storage is all about unstructured data. And, and, and there, it's not the IOPS that count because, uh, well, uh, some of our friends uh, do need tricks with SSDs. We don't do that. We talk performance, uh, performance throughput to the back end only. And, and that is very important for your unstructured data, for your large movies, for, for the very big files. And we see it, we see it as, I mean, it's very simple, right? We have the primary disk for your high performance. Uh, and traditionally, you, you have the other place you store it is on, on tape for the archive. Well, object storage is creating this new archive disk um, intermediary layer. So, you know, from our perspective, we're going to be moving data from primary storage when movie producers and directors don't need that data anymore, but they want a uh, they want access, but maybe not at the, the latency that tape would give them. So that's going to be stored on this archive disk for the very deep, deep storage that is not going to require anyone really to look at, it, but they've got to keep it. That's where tape is going to play a role. But we see this this, this three tier architecture: the primary disk, the uh, archive disk, as we'll just describe it here, which is the object storage, and then ultimately tape. Is, is just a great, it's a kind of a great way to just to, you know, architect your, your storage solution. Guys, our, uh, our, our time is officially up. It was actually officially up a few minutes ago. If you guys want to leave, uh, feel free. Uh, but if you want to continue the discussion, uh, let's have some questions. I think I heard one. And so the question is, uh, what's the fundamental Uh, so, when I talk about a latency, I'm mainly comparing to tape. So, where you used to have, or where you'll always have archives on tape. So, don't quote me on saying that tape is going to disappear. Uh, but an archive based on tape uh, will not serve or will not be your best solution to have your employees search for, for, for all documents or for movies or whatever. Uh, on disk, you have it available immediately. That is mainly what we are referring to here. Yes, it's computationally intensive. Right. And, and that's where our friends from Intel are doing a wonderful job. Um, it, <laughs> because because they're, you know, every every year the, the, the processors get faster. And I think, you know, just me, look, as an analyst looking over the long term, uh, what I expect to see happen is, is that right now, object storage uh, is maybe mostly suitable for, you know, archive kinds of, active archive kind of applications. But as Moore's Law continues to crank away, uh, I think we're going to see the average level of object storage performance growing so that, uh, increasing so that more applications can can, can access it directly and get reasonable performance. Now, are you ever going to run your 500-man uh, call center uh, databases on object storage? No. That, I don't think that will ever happen. But there's lots of other applications out there where, you know, the, the kind of applications you've got 20 VMs on a pizza box server, um, hey, the 
potentially, you know, uh, within five or ten years with Moore's law, I could see I could see that moving yeah. to object storage directly. It, it, it is possible, but it's not the best use case. We've done it, but we decided that there's more benefit than unstructured data. Okay. He was just telling me their focus is on un unstructured data. You actually can run VMs on it, but it's not, you know, optimal today. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, so uh, help me sort out this whole controversy that you had between you about uh, a different type of archives and the performance versus uh, accessibility issue, or performance versus really capacity. Uh, now it seems like, uh, on the one hand, one solution uh, is supposed to improve performance, and the other one is capacity, but you're, you're saying that both is possible, is it? So I think, let me address that, right? I mean, we have different workloads in our data centers. So on the performance scale, you would see your OLTP databases. On the capacity scale, you will see, you know, your archives and the object storage, right? Uh, there, is, there are other workloads within, uh, you know, for example, the business analytics, for example, the high-performance compute type, for example, the application data, which is, you know, virtual machines being stored in the virtual, uh, virtualized data centers. Those applications and those workloads would always have their own storage infrastructure, such as HDFS is there today for uh, business analytics. But the amount of data that they are working on, right, that is huge amount of data. Think about a pharmaceutical company. They use you know a lot of the you know gene sequences, right, to develop drugs today. But once you develop the drug, you still need to store. Government requires you to store that simulation for next 20 years. Where are you going to store all that stuff? In the Lustre file system that you use for your H, you know, high performance compute? No, that's a pretty bad place to store that data. But you still have that, all that data. You're going to put it in large object storage, right? Because you're not going to put it on tape, because you're not going to stop developing drugs, right? So those gene sequences and stuff, you're going to put it on large object storage on the disk. And then the next drug that you're developing, you still have access to that data. You're going to use something like Aspera or so to transfer you know, efficiently all that data into your, you know, from the large object source into your HPC environment and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but I mean, that's clear enough. 